Well, welcome everyone to this uh, sustainability speaker series. It's also a collaboration with the Visiting Writers Series, which is a program of the English department at Wiles College. Uh, and it, we're also co-sponsored tonight by the Sustainability Academic Program here at Wiles College. I'm Marion Brown. I head the Center for Sustainability here at Wiles and just delighted to be able to welcome everyone here. This event is uh, co-sponsor or it is co-hosted by those three groups, but we have some underwriting sponsors as well who have made uh, Aya de Leon's uh, appearance possible. Uh, the Sustainability Speaker Series is sponsored by the National Fenestration Rating Council, which is an organization that holds sustainability as a guiding value. They also provide uh, objective, scientifically rigorous uh, ratings for windows, doors and skylights, which if you wondered what a fenestration is, that is what it is. The Visiting Writers Series is supported by Wells College, the New York State Council on the Arts, the Mildred Walker Fund for Fiction Writers, and gifts from the college's alumni and alumni and other friends and supporters. So we thank our underwriters uh, for this, for making it possible to bring to you Aya De Leon, who's an award-winning author, activist, and speaker. Through her speaking and writing, Aya expertly explores the intersections of race, gender, socioeconomic status, and climate justice. She's published several novels for adults, young adults, and children that examine racial and social identity and its connections to climate justice. She currently directs the Poetry for the People program in the African American Studies Department at UC Berkeley, teaching poetry, spoken word, and climate writing. Uh, and for those of you who got a chance to uh, attend uh, Aya's masterclass at five o'clock, uh, we learned a little bit more about uh, all of that process, which is great. Since 2021, Aya has been organizing the Black Hive, the climate justice formation of the movement for Black Lives. In 2022, she organized an online conference entitled Black Literature versus the Climate Emergency, calling for more Black people to join the climate justice movement. Aya's writings have appeared in Harper's Bazaar, Ebony, Guernica, Writer's Digest, Bitch Magazine, Vice, The Root, and Plowshares. She was also a founding blogger with The Daily Dose, Feminist Voices for the Green New Deal. Prior to writing fiction and nonfiction, she was an award-winning spoken word and hip-hop theater performing artist. Aya received her BA from Harvard University and her MFA from Antioch University. Please help me welcome Aya de Leon. Hello, can everyone hear me? So I think we have another VIP in the house. Did I see Ada Twist Scientist? Is that true? Yes, hello Ada and hello Ada's friend. Um, so I am delighted to be here tonight. I'm also a working mom. At some point during our talk, my eyes will dart to the side because my daughter's coming in the house and I'll get her settled. Um, but you know, here in the climate crisis, we've got to keep it real. Um, in the pandemic, we learned that some people work at home and their children sometimes run through the Zoom in their underwear. So these are all things that we've learned. Um, so it's just really exciting to be here today. The masterclass was just such a good conversation um, about writing and really kind of about propaganda. You know, what what is it that we, what is the message that we want to get out there? Oh, one uh, minor correction I just need to put in for the recording, lest anyone uh, get their, get the, the articles and the prepositions wrong. I don't organize the Black Hive. I am an organizer in the Black Hive. And the Black Hive is a network of many, many organizations and organizers. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, which is part of the movement for Black Lives. So I'm going to talk a bunch about, um, about climate and in particular about the climate crisis. And I'm gonna talk about it intersectionally um, in terms of how it, wait, hold on. I'm figuring out my Zoom people. Um, in terms of how it uh, intersects with issues of racial justice. Okay, I think this is what we're doing, yes few slideshow. Oh, and I lost my light. 
but you can still see me, right? Excellent. See? And for that, you can thank the sun. Okay. So I'm going to, it's because I'm in California and the sun is still up. I'll figure out when I need to fi fix my light. Um, so I want to talk about the climate crisis. And um, one of the things that I think is important if we're going to talk about it intersectionally is to begin by talking about the climate crisis isn't something happening in the future. Um, this is especially true for front, frontline communities. People of color in the West and the global South are being devastated now. Um, in particular, racism, anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, and climate justice are intertwined. As Varshini Prakash, one of the co-founders of the Sunrise Movement said, if Black lives mattered, we wouldn't be in a climate crisis because the US would have changed its policies after Hurricane Katrina because the level of human suffering and life lost would have been unacceptable. But as the Movement for Black Lives says, we will not sacrifice Black lives or accept false solutions that per perpetuate unjust social and economic systems. Climate justice is racial justice. Um, so while millions of people are suffering and dying, there are really only about 100 companies who are causing and benefiting from the climate crisis. And just the climate crisis 101 is that, um, particularly since the industrial revolution, but some of us uh, kind of think about extractive policies that go back to slavery and before, um, the burning of fossil fuels is having devastating effects on the environment and on the climate. And if we don't stop burning fo those fossil fuels, um, the harm may become irreversible. And so while millions of people are suffering and dying, only about 100 companies uh, cause and benefit from the climate crisis. And we need to build a mass movement for climate justice and build the people power that will force those companies and policies to change and to create climate solutions that work for everyone. So as Black people, it's important to make the connections between the need to shift priorities and resources. So for example, while for many years people talked about police reform, more recent and more radical visions are about defunding the police, right? Actually taking the resources from militarizing the police and having the police driving around in these fossil fuel cars and putting those resources into the communities to address the root causes of crime and the issues that make communities less safe. Because, um, for so many people, we really would prefer to have tools and resources to de-escalate crime and conflict in our communities than having folks who have been trained to use deadly force breaking down our doors. Um, so these are really important connections to make. For climate, we have a short window before our car carbon emissions of today will lock in a domino effect of climate disasters for centuries to come. But scientists are also 100% certain that if we make big changes, we can save the planet. The, large, the latest info I have is that if our fuel if our fossil fuel emissions can peak by 2025 and we can cut them rapidly after that, we can ensure a livable future. Now, the problem is that this information is not widely known because there's a nasty rumor going around that we've already lost. We live in a world where societies systematically traumatize and oppress us. Um, molding some of us to dominate and others of us to accept domination. But this is our conditioning and not our nature. And now is the time to fight to reshape our world into and according to the deeply human traits of empathy, generosity, and justice. This is the battle of our lifetime and the biggest battle our entire species has ever faced. This crisis won't be solved 
by space travel or the billionaires who exploit their workers to afford rocket ships. This battle will be solved by mass movements that tap into the best of humanity and everyone's long-term interests. So I'm going to ask folks to take a moment and write down 10 words that you associate with the climate crisis. So yeah, just take a quick moment and write down your 10 words. All right, I'm gonna ask people to put those 10 words in the chat. Um, so you don't have to put all 10, you can put one, two, all of them um, as you choose. Okay. Um, so it's good to think about what do we associate with um, the climate crisis? And part of what I'm interested in doing is helping people develop different associations. One of the literary associations that people have with the climate crisis is things like apocalypse, dystopia. And I appreciate those kind of cautionary tales that we've been getting for the last 30 years since Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. Um, but I am excited for us to look at and think about telling different stories um, about what is possible. Um, not just the stories of what will happen if we don't act, but the stories of what the world could look like if we do. Um, it's time to tell a here and now story about building movements, about fighting and winning. As you'll see, I'm sort of obsessed with this notion of fighting and winning. As an author of climate fiction and the executive editor of Fighting Chance Books, I have one main goal, to interrupt certain lies that are being told about the climate crisis. The first lie, that climate is not a Black issue, that it's not an issue for people of color. This is simply not true. Climate is very much a Black issue and a people of color issue because we are among the hardest hit by the climate crisis. Our communities in the US, in the Caribbean and in Africa, as well as throughout the global South. Racism and colonization have historically demanded our suffering to, in, to secure corporate profit. And now our communities continue to be sites of dispossession and extraction as climate catastrophes increase across the globe, keeping us from a just transition to a zero carbon economy. So fighting for climate justice is fighting for racial justice. The scientists have been very clear for a long time. The burning of fossil fuels has changed the climate, and now we have moved into a state of emergency. For decades, mainstream media and corporate interests were so successful at climate denial and disinformation, the public didn't have the information needed to be fully informed and take action. But now that the science is increasingly undeniable, there's another major lie out there. We're doomed. We're all going to die. These are lies in two different ways. First of all, we are not doomed. Oh, let me make sure I can 
there we go, change our slide. Scientists are clear, we absolutely can save our species if we make the changes needed to decarbonize our economies. But the second part of the lie is even more devastating. They say we are going to die. But the truth is that people are already dying in Africa, in the Caribbean, in frontline communities, in the global north, and across the global south. So many working poor communities, particularly communities of color along with indigenous people and people in nations throughout the global south, particularly island nations. So it's a lie that we're all gonna die. Many people have died, many people are dying now, and we have a chance to save people in the future if we act now, act powerfully, and act together. Another lie out there is that we can solve this climate crisis with some new product or service that would also make a few rich people richer. And that we can just keep doing exactly what we're doing, simply change fuel sources, like electric cars, no gas in the car, problem solved. But like most of these false solutions, there are hidden costs. Let's look at how, many, how much fossil fuel energy is required to manufacture and distribute these cars, as well as how much fossil fuel emissions are required to generate the electricity to power them, not to mention the brutal extraction to get the materials for those batteries out of African or indigenous soil. Suddenly, we are not looking at a green solution, we're looking at a greenwashed solution, one where we are being sold a product that will make us feel as if we're part of the solution when we're still part of the fossil fuel economy. Another lie that we can't is that we can't afford to go green which is a huge lie. At this point, solar and wind power are cheaper than fossil fuels, but the US government has a history of subsidizing fossil fuels, even though our profit-driven economy is collapsing and seems determined to take our species with it. Too many of our elected officials are paid to play politicians serving the interests of fossil fuel profiteers instead of the people. Now, another huge and very distracting lie is that our survival depends on you making changes in your individual behavior, composting, recycling, buying less plastic, eating less meat. All these behaviors are actually very helpful. But even if everyone did all of them, all of the time, it would not be enough to end the climate crisis. This cli crisis is about changing the institutions, systems, and structure of our societies and creating new economic models that are life-giving instead of extractive and death-making. Interrupting the massive carbon footprint of the U.S. military, stopping these 100 corporations from buying our politicians and forcing policies that bring them huge profit and destroy the planet. Like Black author Mary Heglar says, I'm an environmentalist. I don't care if you recycle. We need to stop thinking that our contribution to saving the planet is going to be making individual consumer changes or worse yet, shaming or berating others for the individual consumer choices they are or are not making. Climate solutions require us getting organized to take on these corporations, these banks, these politicians, all the parts of our societies that are invested in the fossil fuel economies. In the US, that means voter mobilization during local, state, and national elections, but community and cultural and political organizing all the time. Now, in this conversation, I focus a lot on the United States because we are the problem, our political leadership and our corporations. When I think about Black people, I think about how Black people in the U.S. are strategically positioned to make the biggest impact as voters and organizers of Black people worldwide. But our perspective must always be international. We move forward in solidarity and conversation with Black sisters and brothers and siblings from Africa, the Caribbean, and worldwide. Another critical lie is because we haven't ever built such a big movement in the past that we can't do it now. This speaks to how we are in the midst of another crisis, a crisis of imagination. According to climate literature visionary Octavia Butler in 1990, she said, what we don't see, we assume can't be. What a destructive assumption, unquote. 
Many of us are unable to imagine a society that isn't organized around corporate profit and run on mass consumption without an ability to imagine Without an ability to imagine anything else, they're resigned to just keep driving the society we have into the ground. Um, but I love this quote um, from a wonderful video that maybe some of you have seen for the Green New Deal that was uh, done by Naomi Klein, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Molly Crabapple at The Intercept. And it has this wonderful quote, we can be whatever we have the courage to see. And to spark that imagination, we need to begin telling new and different stories. Um, so in my day job, which I'm taking some time off from this year, um, I teach at UC Berkeley and I run the Poetry for the People program, which was founded by June Jordan in the early 90s. And what June said um, back in the day, she always asked her students about the purpose of their poems not the subject, the purpose. So as writers thinking about strong active verbs, she wanted the students to think about not just what they wanted their poems to be, but what they wanted their poems to do in the world. So I've been thinking about that myself. And for me as a writer, it has meant writing novels about women of African heritage, living in the here and now, going about their business and being impacted by the climate crisis then deciding to get involved in the movement for climate justice and realizing that the climate issue is their issue because the climate issue is actually everyone's issue. So this is uh, the cover of my latest book, That Dangerous Energy, um, which is yet another one of these stories of a Black woman going about her business and finding herself politicized and caught up in the climate crisis. One thing that I... Uh, have really appreciated has been um, one of the communities that I'm part of that works on intergenerational trauma. And one of the things that they talk about in the work on intergenerational trauma is about how one of the biggest obstacles to people becoming active around the climate crisis has to do with trauma. Most of us early in our lives as young people um, young people being an oppressed and disempowered population have experiences of traumatic early defeats, that there were things that we experienced when we were little, you know, perhaps before we could walk or move or speak or even understand what was going on, hard things that happen um, when communities have intergenerational trauma in a capitalist world where parents have to work so much. Many of us have experiences when we were young where we felt disempowered and defeated. And part of what happens with the climate crisis, because it is so big and so broad and so complicated, is that those trauma recordings that we carry of being disempowered begin to play and they begin to play us. And so when we hear it's too late, there's nothing we can do, it lands kind of in our holistic cells. It lands and reinforces those trauma messages. You're too small and little to take action here. You don't matter. You're all alone. And, you know, we each have some sense perhaps of, you know, what are some of the recordings that play in our minds um, that are challenging for us. And a lot of times we think about how they play out in interpersonal relationships or in places where we feel insecure about work or um, more personal parts of our lives. But I have benefited a lot from this idea that these kinds of trauma recordings are what's playing for us around the climate crisis. And that part of what we can do to take action and to activate others is to do our own work around addressing this early trauma in our lives and to encourage people to notice where those recordings are affecting them. So these are some lies um, that have to do with what keeps us from taking climate action. 
And the biggest lie I believe is that we can't win. Um, what better lie to tell us to get us to give up before we even step into the fight? History has shown us that every time even 3.5% of the population gets involved in a nonviolent movement that we can win. And by the way, that statistic comes from the very fringe and radical uh, organization, the BBC. So that's not, you know, that's not some fringe perspective. That's actually a very mainstream Western perspective. Um, and the truth is that very, very few people benefit from the climate crisis. And the vast majority of people have everything to lose if we continue on the path that we um, are on and everything to gain with a just transition to a world that's more equitable and a world of climate justice. And building that mass movement won't be easy, it won't be painless, it won't be perfect, but it is completely possible and our lives and our futures depend on it. So I encourage all of us to look at um, what that messaging is that we carry around climate and climate justice. What are What is the lens that we're looking at through at the climate um, situation? What is the despair or hopelessness that we may be carrying with us? And what would it be like to let some of that go and to look at the climate crisis from a perspective of hope and possibility with the idea that, you know, as June Jordan said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. So I want to stop my share so I can see the chat. It's perhaps it's possible for me to see the chat without doing that, but I am not savvy enough. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna give you all another 30 seconds to add anything else you want into the chat and then I will check it out. Thank you. Yay, I got my light back. Okay, great. So now I can see in the chat. Oh, these are great. These are powerful words. Um, organizing system change, leverage point, drought, famine, flood, loss, upheaval, huge, predictable, unpredictable, unfair, rapid, devastating, rooted in capitalism, disaster, inequality, injustice, water, air, food, health, emergency change, oceans. Okay. Give me just one moment. I have some parenting I have to do. Oh, parenting, speaking of unpredictable. Um, so let me actually open it up and see if I have a couple of comments while I handle this challenge. James just threw out a uh, 
a question in the chat. There. Oh, excellent. Okay, let me go to the bottom of the chat. Perfect. Okay, hang on. Awesome. I'm wondering, I if you might give some other examples of contemporary narratives, fictional in particular, that are steeped in the kind of hope and op optimism you're uh, replicating in your own creative work. Yes, I'd love to. Okay. Um, so one of my favorite books that I think really um, straddles the two worlds um, is very much coming out of sort of sci-fi fantasy dystopia, but also um, stepping really solidly in, you know, kind of envisioning a different world, solar punk, hope punk, is Sim Kearns's book, Real Sugar is Hard to Find, which I will put in the chat. Um, It's a collection of stories that I um, really, really loved. In particular, the final story, which really is envisioning a future um, where we make the changes we need to make. It was really, really lovely um, and powerful. So that's one. Um, another one that I really loved for young readers is the first rule of Climate Club by Carrie Firestone. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a middle grade. Um, and these, uh, while Sims is more, you know, kind of a little bit futuristic, Carrie Firestone's is very kind of contemporary realistic. Um, I also um, love Julie Carrick Dalton's uh, Waiting for the Night Song. So um, that one's less climate activism and more sort of environmental um, having to do with climate. But, you know, these are all some books that I really have enjoyed. And there are many, many more. And I, the ones that are better known are the ones that are more, um, the ones that are better known are the ones that are more literary. Um, and these are, um, you know, more genre, more popular. Um, the Waiting for the Night song is, um, you know, kind of a thriller. Um, and uh, yeah. And then the books that I write, um, starting with the last book in my Justice Hustlers series, Side Chick Nation, are, you know, not just thrillers, they're like romantic thrillers. You know, I'm writing these sort of sexy page turner beach reads that are very much written for the masses with kind of really mass appeal sensibilities, but have these heavy kind of politics. Um, Inside Chick Nation, which was the first novel published about Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, um, Naomi Klein wrote a nonfiction book about uh, the hurricane in Puerto Rico. And I, my thought was like, I wanted this to be like, for this was about Hurricane Maria for those folks who weren't going to read, you know, Naomi Klein's nonfiction book. This was for the readers who, you know, wanted their um, anti-colonial and climate justice politics sort of wrapped up in something like, you know, sexy and fast paced. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing over here. How would I rate the resistors by Gishchen? I haven't read it. I'm sorry. One of the things that's so uh, I've written a lot of books in the last 10 years. I can't say I've written more books than I've read, but my I've spent more time writing books than I've spent reading them, uh, which is a bummer because there's so many good books out there. Um, and I, um, you know, but it's on my to-be-read list. Um, other questions? Let me look. Um, oh, yes, question. Oh, thank you, Dan, for the bookshop link. The bookshop link. Um, we love bookshop. Thank you for the bookshop link for real sugar. Um, ha, uh, so Vic is asking, have I thought about writing children's books? Yes. Um, I've written a number of children's books. Um, the first one I wrote in 2014 and I self-published, it's called Puffy, People Whose Hair Defies Gravity. And it's about black hair for zero to five-year-olds, you know, and I wrote it when my daughter was very little. Um, puffy here, puffy there. Yay. I love my puffy hair. So it is not about climate, although 
I believe in intersectionality. I'm sure there's a climate angle in there somewhere. Um, then I wrote my second children's book in 2020. Um, and it's uh, Equality Girls and the Purple Reflecto Ray. And it's actually a sci-fi book about a girl who um, who gets so angry at sexism that lasers, purple lasers, <laughs> come, come shooting out of her eyes and she, and mayhem ensues. Anyway, um, I also self-published that and she ends up going up against the then president. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so that's a chapter book for the sort of seven to 10 year old crowd, uh, Equality Girls, and that's available uh, also at Bookshop. Um, and, th and then last year, my first uh, commercially published middle grade book came out and it's called Undercover Latina. And it's about um, a teen spy who is part of an international spy organization called The Factory that um, basically it's like a, a wait, it's like an anti-racist watchdog uh, intelligence organization that nonviolently fights racism internationally. Super fun with teen spies. And uh, the, and the prequel to that comes out this year. It's called Untraceable. Um, and that book, that was a really fun book. It won the Jane Addams uh, Social Justice Children's Literature Award. And, you know, I haven't been writing about climate, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I haven't been writing about climate for young people in part because it's not, young people are already doing a lot. You know, it's really older adults who can vote, who make the decisions about, um, you know, who, who, who could choose to divest from banks, um, you know, we're the ones that have to use our power. And I think young people are already, you know, the ones who feel a lot of the weight and the anxiety. So, you know, I think about what I would say to young people, but currently my message, like we can fight and we can win is really to adults. Cause I think adults need to fight so that we can win. Um, let me see what else we have in the chat. Oh, yay. Good. Um, so let me go back and uh, thank you for your patience as I parented. Um, where were we? Yes. Um, disaster, inequality, injustice, water, air, food, health, emergency, change, oceans, despair, heat, cold, pollution, injustice, greed, short-sightedness, refugee, myopic, avoidable, resilience, colonialism, Capitalism, frontline communities, grief, anger, fear, melting, green, renewable, ozone, underwater, panic, denial, unpredictability, scary, no snow, drought, carbon, solar, politics, alternatives, sea levels, nihilism, blinders, will, denial, health, displacement, severe weather, hunger, unpredictable. Yeah, these are great words. And I loved, you know, I think... One of the really important things that, you know, my peer counseling community has taught me is that we, we, we have to actually feel the grief. We have to actually feel the rage. We have to actually deal with the emotions. We can't just pretend on top of it, like, oh, well, it's going to be fine. You know, we don't want to be Pollyannish, um, but we also don't want to slip into the despair and for me, it's been really important to feel the grief. It's been important to make the connections between the grief and panic and anxiety that comes up around climate and how that connects to early trauma in my own life so that I can sort of heal what happened a long time ago and see the truth of today, which is we don't know what's going to happen, right? We don't know. And this future that we're creating this future that is unrolling, we have the power, not as individuals. None of us is like, wah, 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 I have all the power. But as a species, we have the power to take the collective action, to change the trajectory that those who are currently in power um, have us on. And that really is my message that, you know, we have this power and, you know, it behooves us to figure out how to use it. Dan, you want to jump in? Um, yeah, I think this is great. I just I keep thinking about um, 
so the, the audience for this message that you're that you're offering and um feel very much a part a part of that audience and i imagine everyone on this on this uh call right now probably feels similarly and i was just wondering if you've if you've thought about um or had any experience trying to trying to reach people who are not just feeling despondent but are like actively opposed to this message i'm thinking you know the the people who would deny that there is a problem like that the population that often feels to me sort of unreachable through the rhetorical devices that i have at my disposal like have you have you navigated any of that what a great question so here's the thing <laughs> here's the thing for me i I have made a decision to be an organizer. And part of what that means is that I want to work with people who are moving in a direction, who want to move in a direction, who um, are persuadable to move in a direction. And, you know, I think that there are a lot of people who, you know, really don't see that this is important for them and don't believe that it matters. And, you know, it isn't to say that I only want to work with people who are already 95% there and just need a little push, right? Like I want to work with broad, you know, kind of with a broad spectrum of folks. But I think one of the things that happened in our society in um, kind of 2016 was there was just this sort of obsession, like, how can we, you know, and so this was had to do with, you know, kind of MAGA folks, like, how can we understand them? How can we engage them? How can we fix this? And, you know, I haven't ever really believed that, that the way to end racism is to change the minds of people who are really committed to racism. I believe that the way to end racism is to get white people, um, is to get people of color to look at our own internalized racism, right? And so we can stand up and stand together and to get white people who actually aren't really invested or committed to racism to stand up and to be part of solutions to racism, to get white people who are well-meaning to be more self-aware and less timid, to figure out how to organize white people who would like to do better so that folks can do better collectively. So it's not just on you to be like the one person in the room, ah, who does it, right? So it's really about collectivity and organizing. And there are a lot of people out there who disagree with me, who really disagree with me. And, you know, okay, that's fine. But like not destroying in the planet, not destroying the planet is actually in their interest as well. So if they're committed to this, this path, okay, do your thing, but I'm going to organize and try and build power with people who I'm more aligned with because we're trying to help you out, person who thinks that the planet is expendable. You know, even, you know, dude in his rocket ship, like what's out there? Dude, there's no planet B, right? This is the planet and you can get enough money to go up into space, but there's not enough money to stay up there because there's nothing for us up there, right? This is the only atmosphere where we can breathe. This is the only earth that will grow food that we can eat. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think, for me, it's really been less about how can I turn and face people who disagree with me and more about how can I take a message that hasn't been reaching the masses of people and reach the masses of people. That's really been my thing. Ooh, and there are two more messages in the chat. What do we have? Dun, dun, dun. Was thinking about children's books for the win and how to write that for children of, for for sustaining radical hope. I agree. I think that, you know, I mean, one of the things that's interesting, so my my spy book for kids, Undercover Latina, she like takes on a white supremacist terrorist, right? And it's like, you know, it's like white supremacist terrorism, but it's fun for middle grade, right? So like, part of it is like, how can we talk about these heavy things in a light way, right? Because part of what happens in literature is 
a lot of literature is either so heavy and such a downer and so hard, or it's like, tra-la-la, that's not a problem. We're not going to talk about that. And so again, even in the kids literature, I'm trying to figure out how do we talk about heavy things, but in a light way, you know, like in the chapter book, Equality Girls and the Purple Reflecto Ray, you know, it's talking about sexism. It's talking about sexism for girls. There's like this beauty pageant, right? And the girls are like going into the beauty pageant and like figuring out like, how is it fun and light? And of course, this Donald Trump type character comes to like judge the beauty pageant and, you know, he's part of the shenanigans. So like, how can children and young people envision themselves as powerful? Like I'm writing about teen spies because spying is incredibly powerful. And how do we, um, how do we create stories where young people can see themselves as powerful? Young people can see themselves as the solution. Um, other question. I'm wondering if you would mind talking about the role that your parents as artists had in maybe limiting that early drama or not that you were discussing before that tends to kick in for us when social political challenges feel too large and like a lost cause, or maybe how you try to limit that trauma in your own children's experience. What a great question. Um, yeah. So, you know, I come from artist parents and what was great about that is, you know, I think for most working class people, there's this sense that like being an artist is a fancy thing that's not for us. Like we'll go and watch the movies and we'll listen to the music and we'll, you know, dance to it and, you know, we'll put the posters on our walls, but we won't be the people who draw it or make the music or write the books or write the movies. Um, so that was really useful for me um, in having parents who are artists. So I didn't have that sense of, you know, I've certainly had a little bit of imposter syndrome, but from the beginning, it was like, yep, I come from an artist tribe. This is for me. And that was really quite a privilege and a gift. Um to not have to go through what so many artists go through, particularly working class artists, women and people of color. Um, but, you know, I also, you know, my parents had their challenges that they brought, you know, coming from black, Puerto Rican, indigenous immigrant communities. You know, there was a lot of trauma in uh, my family. Um, and, you know, my parents did their best to keep uh, to do harm reduction on, you know, how much of the trauma would impact me, but I was definitely impacted. And so, you know, I did a lot of therapy. I did a lot of personal healing work in my twenties and thirties and forties and continue to do it. Um, and that was really important and, you know, trying to break certain intergenerational cycles was really important. And I've, you know, I think that's what I would say, just breaking different cycles of intergenerational trauma, um, trying to break them before raising my kids, you know, my kid, um, trying to do it differently while raising my kid so imperfectly. Oh my God. Parenting is the most imperfect thing I've ever done, you know, and that's what it is. Like you do your best and, oh, it's just not enough and it's imperfect and it's a mess. And, you know, then you get to work on your feelings about that and figure out how to support a young person. Um, and, I think having a perspective of hope and activism, like from the beginning with my kid, I've, you know, we've talked about hard things in the world and I've always talked about it in terms of like people get hurt and then they really struggle to make good choices, you know, and that goes, that, that is like the kid who's pulling another kid's hair in school and that's the president and that's the CEO of this corporation and that's, you know, a mass shooter and that's war. You know, I think it's pretty across the board, the perspective that human beings are good and human beings get hurt. And when human beings are hurt, they can cause a whole lot of pain and suffering. Um, and both saying and modeling that human beings who have trauma can also heal. One of the things I heard recently at a workshop is that there have been like 26,000 generations of human beings, something like that. And that means in terms of intergenerational trauma, we have like 26,000 generations where trauma gets passed down. And, you know, communities have had ways to attempt to kind of clear trauma. It's not like we're the first people to have any healing tools, but, you know, contemporary life has particular tools to look at and deal with and heal intergenerational trauma. So we're, you know, we're just getting started in this sort of more contemporary approach to it. And 
um, you know, and we've done a lot. Um, like, I don't know, um, looks like we have a sort of a multi-generational crowd here, but I just hear how young people today talk about themselves emotionally and how much more self-aware they are. It just shocks me, you know, to hear like 10 year olds say, well, you know, I'm dealing with some anxiety today. And I'm just like, gee, me too. You know, like it's there. They're just so aware and thoughtful about themselves. And, you know, those are big wins. Um, and, you know, we have a long way to go around intergenerational trauma, around violence, around self-awareness. Um, but the tools are out there, both the political organizing tools, the emotional tools, and the cultural tools. And, you know, so that's the thing that I'm trying to do with um, my publishing venture, which is called Fighting Chance Books. We're new. We're an imprint of She Writes Press. Um, but unlike She Writes, which is designed for women, we're open to authors of all genders. And, you know, I'm hoping to publish two books this year. Um, and uh, one of them is mine. Uh, and, you know, the vision really is about having an imprint that's all about telling a story set in the here and now, setting telling stories, right? Many stories set in the here and now about how people come together, take collective action to solve the climate crisis and win. That's really what I want, you know, what I want to put out there. And I think about it as climate justice fiction propaganda, you know, because that's my message that we can fight and we can win. And I want, you know, I hope for people to feel inspired. I hope for people to feel excited and inspired and um, to consider like, what can I do? Right. And it's not about one person having all the power to do it all. It's about how can I build community and relationships to use the power that I have, the relationships that I have, um, to activate the community that I'm part of, or the communities that I'm part of for a mass movement. And, you know, it's, it's not easy those of us who are part of it now, and it's not going to be easy. And race and racism has been a huge obstacle, but I, I'm excited at, you know, the kinds of, um, at some of the kinds of shifts and progress we're making. One of the things that is amazing is to see, for example, the work coming out of Barbados with the prime minister of Barbados, who is taking these incredibly bold stands and making these incredibly bold, um, taking really bold initiatives around climate, um, really, really big ways in terms of international finance. Um, that's Mia Motley's work, the prime minister of Barbados, you know, leading the global South in terms of thinking differently about how international finance can work um, to shift uh, things in really big ways at scale around climate. It's exciting. Um, I was excited to be with, um, you know, to be part of some of the organizing with the Black Hive um, to stop some really terrible climate legislation that almost went through more than once, you know? So there's just a lot of work, a lot of fighting going on out there. And my message to everyone is like, figure out where you fit and participate, get involved. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Other questions or comments for Aya? I'm going to see if I can find, God, I feel like I sent it to someone. Let's see if I can find that. Um, maybe it's here. That um, it was a new, well, here's what I'll say. It was a New York Times podcast after COP27 um, that had to do with Mia Motley's work in Barbados. And I can't, uh, if I can't uh, pull it up quickly, it's like December 5th of last year. Um, if I can't pull it up quickly, then I will encourage you all to look it up because it was so inspiring in terms of thinking about. Um, Did I just throw it in the chat there? 
Yes, da da da, beautiful. That's the one. It's so good. Wait, what did I do? Great. So I have a completely random question for, well, it's not totally random, but I had the privilege of seeing your online bio with the Speak Out organization with, from whom, uh, with whom we made connection. Uh, but I saw that one of your titles, uh, your Feminist Heist series is being optioned for television. Ah. So if you had control over casting the role, who would you like to see? as your heroine or heroine. Oh my God. Well, so the first thing I have to say is, um, yes, my, so my Justice Hustlers series, it's a feminist heist series set mostly in New York City, uh, four books so far. And the last one is Side Chick Nation, which uh, was my Hurricane Maria book. Um, and that was the one that got me optioned. As of now, that project isn't currently moving forward, but it might move forward. We worked on it for a while and we got close and all the things, um, but it's not dead in the water. It's just for various, I learned a lot about Hollywood for various reasons having to do with Hollywood. It's not moving forward at this time. Um, but you know, I thought a lot about it. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought a lot about it. There were a lot of different people that I imagined uh, being cast, but we never quite got that far. And I think the thing that's really exciting to me about television, oh, I will say something about television. So, um, oh, first of all, I'm putting in the chat, um, the talk that I gave tonight, parts of it came from uh, the welcome that I did for an online conference last April called Black Literature versus the Climate Emergency. Um, and so in that, I talked, uh, I talked more about Octavia Butler. I talked about different stuff, but I'm putting that in the chat. And then um, the other thing about Hollywood that I'm putting in the chat is this great book called The Good Energy Playbook. Um, and this is um, written by, uh, you know, a collective of folks and one particular woman who was spearheading it, who wanted to talk about how Hollywood could do better in terms of messaging around climate. And so there's some great work in there. She interviewed me talking about kind of black folks and black stories and climate. Um, and at the time, you know, I was working on trying to get some climate um, content into the pilot that we were working on for uh, the Justice Hustlers. And sadly it did not, you know, it didn't go at the time, but it's, it's not dead in the water. And I think, Dan, I think you were saying um, you had asked about, I have this like um, entertainment franchise that I wrote something for. And, you know, I had to sign an, uh, an NDA non-disclosure agreement. So I can't tell you, oh my God, I want to tell you, but I can't. <laughs> but what I will say is, you know, it'll be announced later this year. And, you know, when I got asked to write for this entertainment franchise, one of the things for me that was sort of a, a deal breaker um, or something I was just going to fight like hell for was to be able to tell a climate story because this is going to be the biggest platform I've ever had. And it was really important for me to tell a climate story and to have some basic climate messaging like it, you know, it is still possible to win and it's not and greenwashing is not going to be how we win and it's got to be the people fighting so you know that's that's what I tried to get in there <laughs> but we'll see because when you write for these entertainment franchises you know they make the final decisions about what the story is but you know I'm hopeful so but you see me I'm pretty I'm a pretty hopeful type <laughs> great any last questions for Aya no, well, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. And thank you so much for your inspirational words. I, it's, it's great to, to have a hopeful frame to walk out with. So thank you all for coming uh, and uh, have a great night. Thank you all. It's been a delight. Take care. Thank you.